Okay, so we have Kate Cahey with us today uh, for the data seminar. She's a uh, senior scientist at Argonne National Laboratories Computer Science and Mathematics Divisions, and she also holds uh, an affiliation with the University of Chicago through CASE, which entitles her to have space at the lab and to you know have accounts, and and uh, I believe it also allows you to uh, submit through the. Um, uh, the, the funding portals at the university. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a convenience that allows folks to uh, bridge into the academic side of things. She's gonna tell us about work that's been ongoing for several years that culminated into this project. The Chameleon Project is a composable resource for folks to have privileged and use, um, uh, use, use resources that are uh, bare metal uh, to do sort of uh, at research type oriented things in this environment. So um, we'll not say anything more, I'll hand it over to Kate. Okay, well, thanks thanks very much for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me. I love talking about Chameleon, of course. So let me see first if I can share the screen. Let's see, we try this and we try this. Can at least one person see my slides? It looks good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, then we're, we're almost there, right? <laughs> just now I can just fast forward, pass the slides. It's going to be good. So yes, um, I am going to uh, be talking today about Chameleon, which is a, a platform. So as, as Jonathan explains, an NSF funded platform, even though I work for Argon, I uh, am affiliated with the university. Actually, most, most of my work uh, happens on the university side. And this platform was funded to provide a scientific instrument, a, a test bed for computer science research, right? So computer science research, you're designing new operating systems, you're, you're exploring issues of variability, designing new networking protocols, all sorts of things. And for that, you need a special kind of scientific instrument, right? So like biologists have a microscope, uh, astronomers have telescopes. What do computer scientists need? And it turns out computer scientists need something like chameleon. And just for those of you who have to rush out of the talk after the first five minutes, here's one slide, chameleon in a nutshell, tell you all about it. Um, and then the rest of that is going to be details. And I'm going to elaborate on, on specific three areas that we work on today. One of them is edge computing, reproducibility, um, and then also composable hardware. So it's, a, it's a long talk. Um, usually I talk about just one of them, but today I'm gonna try three. But first the introduction. Um, so first of all, where does the chameleon name come from? Well, chameleons like to change. And of course a test bed for computer science research was a test bed that had to be very deeply reconfigurable, right? At the metal level and, and provide isolation between experiments. So uh, that's why Chameleon, we provide bare metal reconfigurability. You can reboot the machines, power them on. Not, of course you have root, you can boot from custom kernel. I very often explain this, that yes, you can boot from custom kernel, you can do all this complex stuff. And at the end of the talk, people say, and can I have root? Of course you can have root, right? Um, everything that you need, you can change the firmware, whatever it is that you need. Now, um, that does mean that you get uh, an allocated node all to yourself. And of course, when we started building Chameleon, I'll believe the Haswell nodes that we bought were, I think, 24 cores. These days, we're buying nodes with 128 cores, right? So those are huge, huge nodes. And uh, allocating that node or many of those nodes uh, to one user is expensive. So we do also provide it, and we have provided since the inception of the project, a, a KVM cloud, right? So our images, you can use them on bare metal, you can use them on KVM, but on KVM, you can get a, a virtual machine per core, roughly speaking, so you can use the resource more efficiently. And those projects that don't need bare metal reconfigurability, right? If, you, if you're doing power management or performance variability, you do. But if you're teaching, for example, uh, uh, KVM virtual machine might be easier. So for those projects, we provide that. Now for hardware, we try to balance diversity and scale. So Chameleon started out as two supercomputing centers. 
one at UC, one at TAC. I mean, UC, of course, is not a, a supercomputing center, but our machines are in the ALC at machine room. So two supercomputing centers connected with 100G network, right? So you could experiment at scale. You could also experiment with large flows over that network. Um, and we expanded. So these days we actually support experimentation with edge devices. And I'll talk about that more later. Um, we're also trying to have the hardware uh, be very diverse. So we support all sorts of different generations of, of FPGAs, uh, GPUs, uh, NVMEs, consumer grade, uh, enterprise grade. Uh, we've got NVDIMs. We've got Corsa switches, which are very interesting uh, networking technology that uh, supports software-defined experiments. And, and these days, uh, as I was saying, edge devices. And it is distributed. So we started with just two sites, but uh, within the last year, uh, we were joined by three volunteer sites. One of them at NCAR. NCAR uh, contributed very interesting ARM Thunder X2 nodes, uh, very interesting to, to some of our users. Uh, Northwestern has uh, interesting networking hardware. North, Northwestern is Starlight. So they've got nodes with uh, 100 G NICs, and they've got, of course, access to excellent networking infrastructure there. And um, UIC University of Illinois in Chicago. And we are talking. Um, to various other places. So IIT is in the process of configuring another volunteer site. We're also talking to Oak Ridge and SDSC uh, about configuring sites there as well. Now, Chameleon is, as, a, as, a, as an experimental infrastructure, is a little bit different than from those that came before it in that oh, we figured out how to support all those experimental capabilities on top of mainstream cloud infrastructure called OpenStack, right? Before uh, things like that were typically supported based on infrastructures developed in-house, um, but using a mainstream infrastructure as a base has many benefits, right? One thing is it's familiar to our users, it's familiar to operators, if it's not familiar, then people acquire transferable skills, but also, it's, it's the result of work of a relatively large uh, community. There were like um, contributions from over 2,000 different programmers to OpenStack. Um, over 6,000 people reviewed the code, right? So that's uh, of huge benefit. Um, and that means that essentially every time we upgrade the version of OpenStack, we are able to give our users some additional features, some new capabilities that were not possible before. And then, of course, that means that we ourselves can contribute back to that community. And for example, we contributed a component that handles uh, advanced reservation called Blazor. And in 2017, it became a, a top-level component of OpenStack, right? So that sort of multiplies our own broader impacts if we can develop something for our users, but then make it available to um, through a system that is used by, by millions of, of people worldwide. So um, the system is, we, roughly speaking, you know, 50-50 split between mainstream OpenStack and uh, special sauce that implements various special features in networking, for example, in, in reproducibility, which I'll talk about later, and, and in, for example, allows us to provide uh, access via federated identity to our users and so on and so forth. And then last but not least, um, having realized that, that open test beds provide a kind of a baseline for reproducibility of research, right? Because it's no longer the case that, that you have access to GPUs and I don't have access to GPUs. So you can publish a paper on, on machine learning and I can't reproduce your experiments because I don't have access to this hardware, right? Now with an open test bed, that problem just goes away. So we realized that early on, we said, geez, we could really leverage that as a reproducibility platform and, and support the development of better sharing within the community. And that's what we did. And, and over the years, we invested into a range of tools um, from Jupyter integration, through Chameleon Day Pass that gives you temporary access to the test bed for the purposes of, of reproducing somebody's experiment uh, to infrastructure called Trovi that is now being um, adopted by the Fabric test bed as well for sharing experiments, contributing sharing experiments, 
and integration to Zen with Zenodo for publishing. So a little bit more about that later, but first here's quick chameleon in the numbers. So chameleon was funded in uh, 2014. Um, it uh, uh, opened, the, the, the public availability was in July of 2015. Since then, we managed to serve over 6,000 users working on over 800 uh, unique uh, research, uh, education, and emergent applications projects, right? So that gives you the, that gives you an idea of what we support. Computer science research, computer science education, and projects in emergent applications. The only thing we don't support is uh, production science, right? So the system is set up for different things. And of course, many papers were published. Some of the numbers here need to be uh, up, updated a little bit. And right now we are funded through the end of 2024. So we've got still uh, uh, almost three years to grow. A quick look at uh, Chameleon hardware. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got two main sites, one at University of Chicago, one at TAC, and we have uh, different generations at this point of various uh, Intel processors, right, from Haswell to uh, Ice Lake more recently and AMD nodes different generations of GPUs, FPGAs, um, a, a range of storage solutions and, and various different networking and interconnects. And of course, at University of Chicago, we also set up this G at Edge testbed uh, for experimenting with Edge devices. Uh, both University of Chicago and TAC have access to large global store uh, at TAC that's uh, almost four petabytes of storage uh, at University of Chicago, half petabyte. Um, and then we connect to um, other partners via Fabric. Uh, we can connect to commercial clouds via Cloud Bank, right? So we um, uh, support federated identity. You can log into those test beds with one thing, single sign on with Chameleon. And as I mentioned, we've got associate sites. Those are those volunteer sites at NCAR, Northwestern, UIC, and a few other ones in the works. So that's the hardware. Now, when you come to the test bed, what, how are you going to interact with it, right? And I always explain it in terms of, of, a, of an experimental workflow, right? When you come up with hypothesis, and uh, then you have to find resources uh, on which you're going to validate that hypothesis, then you have to somehow get hold of them, allocate them, and then reconfigure them to, to suit your experimental uh, apparatus, and then you finally run your experiment, you, you monitor it. So for, uh, for resource discovery, we provide uh, the resource descriptions that are fine-grained, complete, up-to-date, and versioned, right? So we, we extract those resource descriptions in an automated way, and every time we change something in the testbed, we create a different version, because um, especially experiments that are very sensitive to hardware and firmware changes, these types of things tend to matter, right? So if you're trying to reproduce your experiment, it's not going so well, then you can ch check the version and see what changed from version to version. So secondly, um, most resources in Chameleon can be explicitly allocated. So you can allocate nodes, but you can also allocate networks and you can allocate IP addresses, right? So if you, um, have a demo, right? We can, you, you want to make sure that uh, everything is available. You can allocate all those different resources. It's a little bit like adding things to a shopping cart. And then finally you check out, right? When you're ready to, to run your experiment. Now, all of these allocatable resources are available on demand, but we do also support advanced reservations. Why? Because things are not always available on demand in practice, right? You can ask, you can request them on demand, but they may not be there for you. So to illustrate, here is a, a snippet of the Chameleon lease calendar, right? So, so this is what you see uh, on our webpage when you go and, and try to check which resources are available. So on the X axis there, you've got uh, time. Uh, so in this case, this is showing you about one month's worth of, of resource availability. And on the y-axis, uh, you've got the various different nodes. Um, and as, as it happens right now, um, uh, this, this has been filtered on our GPU cluster at TAC, right? So when you come to the test bed, you see that um, at the moment you come, which is in this zero timeline, all the resources are taken, right? Other people are using them, ex experimenting with them, right? So 
you would be constantly out of luck or you'd constantly have to be refreshing that page uh, if you wanted to get a resource, if it was not for advanced reservations. With advanced reservations, you can say, well, um, I see some availability roughly a week from now, so I'll make a reservation for that resource, right? Like two weeks, two weeks from now in this picture, you could reserve you know, at least eight of those of those things, right? So uh, this is very handy uh, to manage conflicts. And then um, there is a, a, an open question on whether resources should be fungible or presented as, as fungible or non-fungible entities, right? So in other words, the question is, is, is a Haswell node very much like another Haswell node or are they different? And for a lot of people, they are very much the same. But for many of our users who work on, on uh, performance variability or power management, they say they are not at all the same, right? So we allow users to um, allocate nodes in both ways, right? You can come to the test bed, you can say something like, I want two nodes and I don't care what they are as long as they are on the same switch or in the same rack, right? Because uh, latency matters to you. Or you can come to the test bed and say, I want a Haswell node, I don't care which one. Or you can say, I want, this particular node, right? And some of our users uh, sometimes just want to say it just for the peace of mind, right? They're working on something that exhibits some variability and just want to make sure that uh, it's not the hardware. So you've got the nodes, you've got your networks, you've got the IP addresses, uh, what can you do with them? So first of all, you can reconfigure them at bare metal. Right, or you can uh, create virtual machines. So there's a, a partition of the test that's set aside for that. For edge, you reconfigure them using containers. Um, in addition to that, right? So you know, you make sure you don't have to start from scratch. We provide a fairly rich catalog of various images. So you can have uh, CentOS images, Ubuntu images. You can have images that uh, represent virtual clusters. We've got a very nice image virtual clusters uh, uh, managed by Ken Raffinetti at, um, at MCS. Um, and you can take those images and whatever they represent, right? Some of them have uh, various NVIDIA um, software on it or things like TensorFlow or whatever. So whatever they represent, you can configure more stuff on those images. And when you're done with your environment, you can snapshot them. In other words, you can save it. Uh, so that means that next time when you come to the test bed, you want to uh, recreate that environment, you just deploy from that snapshotted image, right? You don't have to configure it from scratch. Um, orchestration, orchestration means that if you have a complex uh, uh, experiment, like for example, a, a widely distributed networking experiment, or, um, or a virtual cluster or something like that, which involves uh, configuring multiple entities, right? So you can create an orchestration template that will do that for you automatically. We also support Jupyter integration, which is an alternative way of doing orchestration, which is largely preferred by our users these days. And we provide interesting networking capabilities. So we support stitching, so uh, creating of isolated uh, network circuits, wide area network circuits, and something called bring your own controller, which works with our cross switches and allows you to create your own controller and use it in the configuration of your experiment. Now, all of this is um, available via authenticated, uh, federated uh, ident identity authenticated access, right? So you can log into Chameleon with your uh, LBNL credentials. Um, and But you will need to have a project. You need to create a project to actually get access to the resources. But, but as far as authentication, uh, that should be handled. And we support three kinds of interfaces to all of this. One via GUI, one via CLI, command line interface, and one via uh, Python. So we've got a library called Python Chi which gives you programmatic access to the test bed. And you can see that I bold faced this uh, a little bit uh, because this now means that you can create experimental environments programmatically, right? So you could argue that you can already create that with orchestration templates, but uh, using Python allows you to create those um, uh, experimental environments in a much finer grain uh, way uh, in an imperative rather than declarative manners, which matters hugely to our users. And what matters most is that it allows you to create, to program the testbed 
in a non-transactional way, right? So that means that you can replay the creation of your environment of the hardware that you need or in configuring the hardware that you need for your experiment, right? Bit by bit. And if something goes wrong or you want to change something, you're gonna be able to do that, right? Transactionally, uh, orchestration templates work transactional. So that means that you say go and it goes. And if there's a problem, uh, well, then you're out of luck. <laughs> so, um, and then of course, if you want to, uh, there's a paper, right? If you want to learn more about um, how we made uh, certain design decisions and, and choices and why we made them, uh, that's all summarized in the, in the paper and, and how resources are used and so forth. So this is what hardware we have. This is how you can use it. And here is how our users. So, so normally I would have uh, many slides of we accumulated over the many years of the testbed uh, showcasing our user projects. This at some point became a little bit infeasible, but uh, at, at the bottom there, you've got a link to our blog. Uh, every month we profile one of our users' experiments um, partly to learn what they are doing. So our, our users are doing amazing stuff, right? And, and partly also so that others could learn what they are doing. Um, and so these days, what I show is just mainly a collage of uh, our users uh, presenting their research at conferences, working in their labs or, or, or collecting awards. However, I'd like to point out in the, in the top left corner there, there is a, a little schematic from Midgraph from actually a project called Daphne by uh, Mariam Kiran and her team. And I don't know if Mariam is here, but I think I saw Bashir somewhere at some point on the list of participants. Uh, They're doing fabulous research. Uh, you're probably familiar with that, but uh, if you would like to read more, uh, come to our blog and take a look. So, um, Moving on to the new stuff, the emergent stuff on Chameleon, because that's always the most uh, exciting thing about a testbed. Um, recently, we noticed that our users want to experiment with edge devices and with IoT devices. So quick overview of three projects. All, all three were profiled uh, on our blog in just the last year, right? So in, in 2021. One is on the network traffic fingerprinting. This is, this is when your IoT devices, uh, you know, everything is connected these days. So your IoT devices, your watches, your refrigerators, your everything, toasters, and, and so on and so forth. They, they emit, they, you know, since they are connected, they are networking with something and they send messages. And it's possible to infer from those messages, from the patterns that those messages make, what's happening. So for example, down the hall at University of Chicago, we've got this IoT lab, there's a refrigerator in this lab, we've got some researchers who are detecting, you know, how people are interacting with that refrigerator uh, from the network traffic fingerprinting. So this is a sort of a next generation James Bond spyware kind of stuff. Um, second project is, is biometrics. This is some of our users doing research on um, you know how you can access your various devices using your fingerprint. Well, you could make a spoof of the fingerprint, right? The same thing with your face. Uh, some devices authenticate using your face. You can make a spoof from your face, right? So it turns out that now there are also methods based on machine learning that distinguish between those things, right? What's your face and, and what is not a human face, but just a mask, right? So that's another project in biometrics that some of our users were doing. And then final project in federated learning, when you've got data on various edge devices or in, in various places, and that data is private. And if you want to learn from it, if you want to train some algorithms on it, you'd have to move it, but you can't because uh, there are some various privacy policies. So you can train your models at the edge and then you have an aggregator that uh, that stitches them together and, and takes out the learning from those various distributed devices. So um, three projects, um, and there are of course many, many others that made us realize that, that uh, well, science is evolving and this IoT and edge area is important. And we started talking to our users about what they wanted to have. And, and the consensus was that we would like a, an edge to cloud platform, right, that could be programmed, again, a programmable platform, of course, from one Jupyter notebook, right? So, and, and preferably within uh, the same abstractions. 
So based on that, we designed um, the Qi at Edge test bed. Qi stands for chameleon infrastructure, right? and we've got Qi chameleon infrastructure running in data centers, but now also on the edge. And a lot of people here said, well, what we want is a lot like a cloud, you know, just uh, you know, allocate those edge devices and assign them IP addresses, and uh, there we go. Well, other users were saying, well, this is not like a cloud at all. First of all, it doesn't sit in a data center, right? It's going to be outside, out there in the wild. It's also going to be connected with various IoT devices, with cameras, with uh, software-defined radios, and things like that. And those devices are not going to be server class, right? So they won't support IPMI, for example, so the bare metal configurability could be difficult. And there were other things. So our first, what we designed out of this was, uh, we're going to be reconfiguring via OpenStack interfaces as in our main testbed, but by deploying containers rather than bare metal configuration, we will create a plugin model that supports peripherals, uh, will, will support some peripherals, just like support some images, but then let our users extend to whatever they need to support. And most interestingly, we'll support mixed ownership because we'll give users SDK that they can deploy on their own devices, right? So if they have devices in their location, not in our data center, right? And make them available for restricted sharing. So this is something we made available, the, the Chi at Edge, we made it available last year. We had uh, a fantastic summer last year with many research groups um, trying out various projects on Chi at Edge. And we've got this uh, community workshop report that we, we organized the community workshop in uh, at the beginning of September last year. And, and there's a report that summarizes the fi findings and also summarizes what different projects people were doing on the testbed. So I highly recommend if, you, if you've got questions about that, would like to know more, um, uh, take a look at that. And then uh, again, to underline, we are now moving from data centers to edge devices that could be pretty much anywhere, right? Sitting there with your domestic animals and, and tame dinosaurs and, and whatnot. So what, how does that impact now your experimental workflow that you've seen a little bit earlier in the talk? Well, you discover resources that you know, is not likely to change. We now allocate resources in exactly the same way, right? So you can allocate networks and nodes and IP addresses. You can do uh, advanced reservations um, and you can uh, allocate the resources. Now it's really very important to that the resources, the edge devices are not fungible, right? Because one edge device that has a camera pointing at something is very different than another edge device, right? Even though they're both Raspberry Pis or Nvidia Nanos or whatever that is. And reconfiguration via containers, catalog of images, snapshotting, and very important from, for our users, programmability. So again, the Python Chi library works for our Chi at Edge offering. It works in the same way as for our in, uh, in the data center offering. And then it's of course integrated with Jupyter for which many of our users um, use and is available via federated identity as well. So one thing just to underline, you can now have, you can now take the SDK and add your own devices to the testbed, right? This is something that changed very dramatically with the introduction of the Chi at Edge testbed, right? Before we were uh, operating all of the hardware ourselves, it was in our data centers. Now our users say, well, we've got edge devices and I'll just show you uh, uh, shortly in, in the different various different settings that they use those edge devices. Um, and we want to configure and operate them ourselves. But they say, we don't necessarily want to make them publicly available. We just want to make them available to our class or to our collaborators or whoever else is working on that project. So a few examples to follow. Just one last note on Chi at Edge, which is that uh, we, are, we are in the process of migrating to our 2.0 version now, which is more reliable and has better support for the SDK. So um, a few examples. One is an uh, example from Rick Anderson at Rutgers University, 
who is teaching um, AI to kids by uh, having them program self-driving cars, right? So he's, he's got cars like you see in the picture there and they uh, drive around various different tracks of, of made of those orange cones. And the challenge here is to train the uh, uh, machine learning models in such a way that the car can drive uh, across uh, multiple tracks without incident, right? So uh, they love using Cheat Edge because it helps them do, so each car has a, a Raspberry Pi tied to the car and that's where you're running the, the different models. It allows them to make car reservations by reserving Raspberry Pis via Cheat Edge. It gives you access via uh, Jupyter Hub, right? So it gives you, you can program those devices. Uh, provides manageable programmable network connections, and you can program from the edge to the cloud uh, from one Jupyter notebook, right? So if you collect data on the car, on, on that Raspberry Pi, you can, from the same Jupyter notebook, via the same experiment, you can uh, run them to the cloud, or you can download it from the cloud. Within the same experiment, you can also go use our GPUs, train the models, and so on and so forth, right? So. Um, that's one thing that we learned is that a lot of those applications try to mix and match uh, the data center and the edge and in various uh, very interesting ways. So here's another example. This is ARA, which is another testbed actually. It's testbed for uh, wireless networking. It's about a uh, 16 million uh, funded project, which uh, just became funded last summer uh, in, in 2021. And they have, uh, they're trying to address the challenge of making wireless um, broadband in rural communities as ubiquitous and as inexpensive as in the cities. And, and this is a very hard challenge. One way that they are addressing it is by providing uh, spectrum reservations. But uh, they're working with a range of applications, range of agricultural applications where you know, you've got self-driving tractors and drones uh, you've got uh, a phenotyping robot in at, at the bottom uh, bottom left there, uh, with multiple cameras driving around the field, looking at at uh, at the you know at the corn in that field and inferring from what it looks like, uh, you know whether it needs something, whether it needs additional water and 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 so forth, right? And they they came. Uh, testing uh, to test some devices during the summer. They actually liked Cheat Edge so much they decided to adopt Chameleon for their whole test bed, both, both in data centers and, and for the edge. And uh, what's most exciting from our perspective is they will be contributing to Cheat Edge. They will be extending the system to do all those uh, wonderful things that they are doing research on, which is the spectrum reservations and, and so forth. So that was ARA. Here's a, a sort of shifting uh, gears a little bit. Uh, Edge for Marine Biology. So this is a project from the Florida International University. And this is a, a, a project where people are trying to map the fish population in Biscayne Bay, right? So uh, they're trying to understand how factors like pollution and other environmental factors influence the fish habitat. And they've got um, they've got uh, the floats that you see in the, in the picture at the bottom there. Um, that they, they will be equipping with, with various edge devices and improving their ability to, to follow, to recognize the fish. You've got the output from YOLO there to recognize the fish and, and to follow them around and, and infer about uh, their habitat. And they were using Cheat Edge to uh, understand, to uh, effectively plan, right? So to understand the difference between uh, using Raspberry Pis versus Jetson Nanos in, in their exploration, um, how architecturally this all should be structured and, and so forth. And last but not least, uh, a fantastic project, this is a CC Star NSF funded project called Flynet. And they are looking at various things, but among other things, they are trying to uh, dynamically adapt flight plans for drones, right? There's some bad weather, for example, the drone has to fly around it. And again, also very important from our perspective is they are developing sort of on uh, a higher layer of tool, higher level layer of tools on top of, uh, you know, allocating devices and, and um, connecting those devices. And this is very important for us because, uh, you know, Kevin from the picture here, who's a marine biologist, 
uh, does not necessarily want to deal with the low uh, level abstractions that we provide, right? So having something like a workflow, for example, or, or a streaming system that we could give him uh, would be very, very important. And this brings us to the topic of sharing, how the community can advance science by, you know, not just creating new capabilities, but sharing, right? And, and then um, uh, I, I mentioned at the beginning that we're investing in support for reproducibility, but I just wanted to say, what we're trying to do is, is uh, solve the problem of practical reproducibility, right? So we're not necessarily trying to provide solutions that will be good in 100% of cases. 80% is fine so long as they can be used robustly, right? So for example, now when I want to find out about new research area, for example, I, I read papers, I download a bunch of papers and I read them, but I don't play with the experiments uh, in those papers, right? And the question is, why not? And of course, um, part of the answer there is that they are not easily available. But another part is that even if they were packaged in a way that is complete, it would take a lot of time for me to, uh, to replay them, right? Even if they are flawlessly packaged, it would take a lot of time. But if I could do that, if I could play with those experiments, then there's a bunch of applications that could happen, right? I could play with them. I could discover something new. Um, I could maybe, instead of uh, doing everything myself, I could say, well, I'm going to do what these guys did and what these guys did, and, you know, paste them into my Jupyter notebook and do my own experiment based on that. Or I could teach based on that, which would be really cool, right? Because it makes young people feel that they are part of the ongoing scientific debate, right? It's very inclusive to them. So, you know, as I explained earlier, we realized that test beds, especially sort of cloud type test beds, provide a necessary condition uh, for reproducible uh, computer science. One thing is that, uh, of course, everybody has access to the hardware. But the other interesting thing about clouds is that you have to create various configurations as a side effect of your use of the cloud, right? So uh, if, if I'm doing something on my laptop right here or in some machine in the lab that you know somebody else may have configured for me, I don't have full knowledge of necessarily how that machine is configured, right? I could try, I could try to document the main things that, that I know about it, but I can't Generally speaking, I can't take it and give it to somebody else. Now, when you use a cloud, you have you take a, a you know an image, bare metal image, VM image, whatever, but a snapshot of the image, and you have to uh, deploy it on the hardware. And this is not for reproducibility. This is just to use the cloud, right? And and our users have done that. They have created hundreds of thousands, literally, of images that are a very accurate representation of their experimental environment. And they created thousands of orchestration templates that program those images into complex distributed uh, experimental environments, right? So the test bed, the chameleon right now is a player for those images, it's like having a long player and a bunch of records, you can, you know, all your experimental environments are a record and you can play them. So what's missing? from that, what's maybe, you know, we kind of as a side effect, just because you're using a cloud, right? We created a bunch of artifacts that take us a long way towards creating something that is reproducible. So what's missing is a packaging, right? A packaging that is easy to unpack to somebody who's repeating the experiment. Um, you know, if I'm reading a paper and I want to click on a graph and reproduce it, I don't want to read a lot about policies that Chameleon, you know, is going to support me or not support me and, uh, you know, how I have to be in academia or in research to be supported and so forth. And I want to be able to discover and find those experiments through various channels, right? Maybe if I buy the latest HPC textbook, Amazon could tell me, oh, you might also want to look at this experiment. Now, for the people who package those experiments, they want to package it in a way that is cost effective, right? So as, as little effort, uh, uh, it requires as little effort as, as possible of their part, but also is then easy for the user to reproduce. 
they would like to give access to that experiment to people, right? Get impact. And then of course, share work in progress with collaborators and, and ultimately publish and advertise the completed work. And all those things speak to three distinct concerns that we implemented in Chameleon, right? The first one is how to package those experiments. And it turns out that Donald Knuth um, has thought of everything and already has thought about this and created something concept of literate programming. And today's most popular uh, implementation of that is Jupiter, who probably everybody here has already used, right? And sort of uh, interesting storytelling because it combines ideas and, and process and results in the same document. But Jupiter, from the perspective of our users, has one huge shortcoming, which is that, well, all your code cells are, are executed in this Docker container. Now, our users, they are not interested in a Docker container. They're interested in something that looks more like this, right? You've got two networking circuits there, multiple switches, multiple nodes, all connected together in a complex distributed uh, experiment. So to support that, we provided a programmable interface to Chameleon, right? Turned Chameleon into programmable platform, programmable testbed, where you can create experiments like that. And when I say programmable, this is very different than accessing something via a GUI, right? Where you click on a bunch of things and you forget where you clicked on and you know nobody can reproduce it, maybe even you can't. This is something that is written down and you can execute it multiple times and you can change it in, in very structured ways. So not only did we provide Python G, so this programmable interface to Chameleon, we also provided it via Jupyter so our users can also leverage this, uh, the fact that they can mingle text with the code and then with the results of the code, right? With the, with the graphs that they create. And there's, uh, you know, I've got one uh, pointer to one um, video here on, on what somebody did, but we've got a whole library of videos uh, that different people did on Chameleon. Um, secondly, what we did is we created something called Chameleon Day Pass, and that's really an ability for you as somebody who created an experiment to give access to others, very short-term access, just for the purpose of reproducing your experiment, right? So you can, when you package a, an experiment in Chameleon, you can request however many day passes, maybe 10 day passes or something like that. You can make them available uh, via a link in your paper, or you can put a QR code on your poster or something like that. Somebody scans that QR code. It takes them to this page, right? They can request day pass and they can get access to Chameleon very directly from you, okay, to reproduce your experiment. So the idea is to get people playing with your experiment. And it's very interesting. In, in the summer of 2020, we had multiple students package experiments from various foundational papers, like AlexNet, for example. And uh, one of my colleagues at University of Chicago, Hariadi Gunawi, uh, also published an experiment from his uh, uh, most recent paper. And it turns out that within a year, over 400, that experiment was, uh, was executed over 400 times, right? It was repeated over 400 times. So that's a lot of interest. There's clearly people want to do that. All right, and last thing we do with those experiments, as I see I'm kind of uh, getting towards the end of time here. Uh, another thing we have is Trovi, which is a, a sharing platform. So Trovi is, is essentially a, a bunch of bins and you take a bin like that and you can put in there your Jupyter notebook, your link to the images that you're using in Chameleon, the data that you're using uh, uh, for your experiments, uh, what have you, right? You can put that all in that bin you can share it with your coworkers on a very fine-grained way, and you can collaboratively work on that uh, on Chameleon or, or other test beds. And then when you're done, right, when you're done, uh, you can publish that to Zenodo. Zenodo is a digital publishing platform which will make your experiments citable, will assign them a digital object identifier. So you can then reference your experiment uh, from your paper. Right, so uh, this is one way in which you can discover those experiments. And in fact, if you're 
interested in, in seeing a bunch of experiments packaged and, and how our users have done it, um, you can go to Trovi on Chameleon and it's, it's available from the main page. So you've got the chameleoncloud.org link at the bottom there. It's available from our main page and, and just look for the experiment tag and see what experiments people have packaged. And on our YouTube channel, we actually have some presentations from students talking about the specific experiment they packaged um, as well. Okay, and last topic on which uh, I wanted to touch right quickly is, is the topic of composable systems, which we're all very excited about these days. And we're excited about it in two ways. One way is um, how can we help our users uh, work with uh, composable systems and, and specifically with composable hardware? And then the other way is can Chameleon itself be a composable system, right? So can we, how can we assimilate other resources dynamically into Chameleon as they become available? Or how can we export our own resources when we're not using them to other systems? So talking to the first thing is we just bought an uh, infrastructure called Liquid. And it's a, a disaggregated hardware infrastructure, right? So it, it's composed of disaggregated pools of components that you can combine flexibly. Um, and you've got a picture here uh, that shows roughly how it works, right? So it, it, you've got, uh, rather than having a node that is composed of all those different components, you've got those expansion chassis. So you've got uh, one for interconnect, uh, one for NVMEs, for GPUs and for CPUs. And it goes through this um, through this switch through these uh, liquid fabric switch, and you can say, you know, uh, my workload today is in the boot for, uh, you know, maybe one CPU, but eight GPUs. I need GPUs is the main thing I need, right? And uh, maybe an NVMe uh, over the network, right? So uh, this is sort of a, a, an interesting idea. Uh, that says, well, if we're allocating everything, uh, at, 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 if node is the unit of allocation, we're not really learning much about the usage, how hardware is used in our data center, or using it very flexibly, right? Maybe, uh, you know, I am running a workload that only uses the only one CPU, but I happen to be running it on a GPU machine because uh, you know, that's what I have available right now, right? Or maybe the other way around. So this allows us to uh, potentially better structure and, and allocate resources. And on Chameleon, of course, we're trying to provide uh, liquid as, as quickly as possible, um, but we also have um, an alternative platform for that experimentation is available right now. So we've got nodes with GPUs um, NVDIMs, SSDs, uh, and uh, all connected by a, by a RDMA, right? So the RDMA here is a bit of a bottleneck, liquid improves on that, but uh, you can run some disaggregated hardware experiments over that. And then of course, this reopens the fungible versus non-fungible presentation debate, right? So you saw, you saw this uh, chameleon availability calendar at the beginning of my talk. Um, and right now, what we show there is a bunch of nodes, and when they are available, maybe in the future, we're going to say, uh, here's a pile of GPUs, here's a pile of CPUs and SSDs, and pick from that pile salt and pepper, summer in white wine, and exactly what your workflow is in the mood for, right? So um, it, it's, it sort of uh, changes the picture there, but that's a sort of a virtualized, fungible view of hardware. What we want to do first is provide this hardware to our users, uh, present it as, as non-fungible hardware, right? So to expose the fact that you can compose the hardware so that people can experiment with them uh, and do interesting things. Um, for Chameleon itself, we have something called China Box, which is a packaging of Chameleon. Um, and um, you know, it packages the, the Chameleon infrastructure as well as its operations model. And we also, you know, the question was, how can I add resources to Chameleon quickly and take them away quickly if I have happen to have some availability? So we implemented a service, which is only internal service. So it's internally available called bring your own device. So as soon as you have point of presence, you, you have a controller node, 
for Camonion on your site, you can now dynamically add and remove resources. Um, and and um, for now, um, most of uh, the Camonion sites, or most, I, I should say, uh, well, most of the Camellion sites are, are con uh, configured as associate sites, right? So they don't leverage this take away resources and add resources model, but some of them will. And in particular, some of the ones that we're talking about right now, um, some of those interactions came out of our engagement with Indy SCC, the student cluster competition, the, the Indy version of the student cluster competition, which we will be supporting for supercomputing 22. We supported it last year. And they would like to make available pop-up sites or pop-up resources to just support the competition, for example, and it's important to add them quickly. Okay, other, other than this, uh, China Box also, uh, you know, it's based on a hub and spoke management model, but at University of Chicago, we package it, everybody else just deploys it. That means that uh, we provide most of the effort of, of, of doing that and, and for everybody else, it's a relatively straightforward uh, operation. Uh, we use containerization to, to streamline that uh, deployment. Um, and, and various other services to uh, make it easier to operate. And it's just a, a quick showcase of, uh, you know, we also provide various monitoring mechanisms for the test that, that measure various coarse grain qualities in this picture, or finer grain qualities if you want to drill down and see what your switches are doing and what your control nodes are doing and, and things like that. And, um, if there are some problems, uh, we have runbook. So we've got uh, an alert manager that talks to us on Slack and points what remediation mechanisms are available. In this case, runbook, and you can pull that up and it shows you, you know, how to manage things. And then ultimately you can fix it. Um, and, and those commits will be broadcast to others uh, as well. Um, and we support three scenarios for this. One is independent test bed. Um, Chameleon associate side and part-time associate side. This is the BYOD model I was talking about when you're adding resources and taking them away. And so far, all the uh, all the uh, sites that you heard about uh, adopted Chameleon uh, as uh, associate sites. So Northwestern, NCAR, and and UIC, and ARA. Of course, uh, you heard me talk about them in connection with Chi and Edge. Uh, decided to adopt it as an independent testbed because they are an independent testbed, but they will be, of course, supporting uh, federated identity access. Uh, so users will be able to um, use both testbeds in conjunction uh, with single sign-on. And one last thing that we also do is we try to say, well, sometimes we don't use Chameleon fully. So you again had this picture from, uh, from our lease calendar, and you can see that there are some gaps, not, not very often and not many gaps. So the question now is, can we export those resources? Can we provide this availability to, to others, right? And in connection with that, we're defining three things. One is the characteristics of workload, then workload that can consume those resources, how to export them, and then what uh, those workloads need to support to consume them. And, and for here specifically, for us, um, we can support high throughput workloads. And we've got an ongoing uh, collaboration with OSG to take all the unused cycles from Chameleon and contribute that to OSG computations, right? Our power usage is going to, to jump up when that is, is right now um, uh, running, operating on a trial basis. Ultimately, this is going to be operating uh, in production. And uh, like I say, our power usage is going to go up. And there's a couple of papers where we're trying to do uh, very similar things. Okay, so parting thoughts, last, last slide. Um, one thing I wanted to call out is, um, you know, operating test beds is a lot of fun, right? Because, uh, and operating any scientific instrument is because it's like, it's like laying down the pavement for, uh, for science to walk on it. Um, our users are constantly discovering 
new questions, new types of research that they would like to do. And we have to adapt to that and we have to provide for it. So you heard me talking about uh, edge computing in particular, that was something that, that our users told us, well, we want that and we have to figure out how to read something up for them to experiment with. Uh, but that taught us uh, uh, an interesting lesson, which is that there is right now great exodus of, of hardware from the data center and into the wild, right? So we used to think about test beds as essentially being a pile of resources. And that was the, the main attraction, right? The pile of resources that, that I could use that were uh, expensive and, and best amortized in a test bed. But now increasingly with edge, certainly users are saying, we have resources, they are not expensive and we have a lot of them. What we want from you is a way to share them, to share them with our collaborators, with our students, and to maybe also connect them to the data center, right? To larger resources with which we need to interact. Secondly, we're trying to create a market for open science, right? So there's a lot of activity right now around um, creating repeatable experiments, uh, uh, various conferences, including supercomputing, require you to some extent to package your experiments for reproducibility, but there isn't a lot that is happening on the, on the demand side. There isn't you know, uh, a, a lot of, of initiatives to create and make it viable for people to reproduce uh, experiments or to play with somebody else's experiments as, as a mainstream activity. And we would like to change that by providing uh, the various tools that I described. And lastly, uh, like I said, great excitement here, composable systems. Uh, and that again is an example of, of how testbed needs to adapt to various research problems that our users bring us, right? There's a great uh, demand for experimenting with disaggregated hardware these days. So we had to buy one and figure out how to make it available to our users, but also uh, in, in our own uh, way, make, make our resources available to others and make sure that we can consume other resources, right? That whoever wants to support science or computer science experimentation, that they actually can. So that's all I wanted to share today. 